This is not a math colloquium I ever wanted to give, but it's come to that. I've lost a dear friend, Mitchell Feigenbaum, and the time has come to tell a tale. I'll do it as a morality play into three acts. In act one, our hero does not do what he is supposed to do. He's banished. But then Deus Ex Machina miraculously rescued. In act two, he does what any one of us would dream we could do. He discovers something delightful and wonderful. And in part three, our hero tells you the truth. What is it that he really wanted to do, but he never accomplished? So the part three, which I hope is most of this colloquium, is oriented toward the future. I hope the mathematicians and physicists get some inspiration in this. For friends, this will be just a kind remembrance of friend that we have lost. Act one. The play, which was written at the end of 20th century, follows the classical Danish Baroque structure. And if you don't understand all of the Danish on the slides, my words will explain it all. We first meet our hero in a graduate student office physics department of Cornell University in the early 1970s. He wanders in and he asks Josserine, uh, would we mind looking at a draft of his paper? He's a new postdoc. They look at the paper and it's you know, a hard calculation, lots of work. It has one remarkable property which distinguishes it from all other such papers. When we get to references, there is one reference. We ask him, how come there is only one reference? He says, well, this reference has all the other references in it. I assumed that this paper was never published, but I checked recently, indeed, it's published, it exists. And disappointingly, Physical Review has forced the author to double the number of references. How did Mitchell, because that was Mitchell, our hero, end up in our office? A few years earlier, he went to MIT and he worked with a famous, but by that time, disillusioned and washed out physicist Francis Law, who has done something very fundamental together with Gelman on renormalization theory. But at the time that Mitchell meets him, he thinks physics is basically dead. The real influence on Mitchell is somebody who has nothing to do with physics as we then thought physics was, which is Jerry Letwin. Jerry Letwin is an MIT professor, especially famous because he debated Timothy Leary, the LSD guru, in a wonderful video I recommend you all should see. And he was the first one to say on a public live broadcast, he was the first one to say, bullshit. <laughs> and thus he became famous. However, what he has in common with Mitchell is an inquiring mind, fascination with Leibniz, and fearlessness in what he thought one should do as a scientist, as a thinker. So by the time Mitchell came to us, he was sent by Francis Law to Hans Bethe as a very smart and promising young postdoc. By the time you meet him, he's obviously very young and very smart. And what he actually does as a postdoc is every early afternoon, which is Mitchell's morning, he gets New York Times and he solves the crossword puzzle. He does it in five, 10 minutes. And on Saturday, which is supposedly hard, he maybe does it in 15 minutes. He's totally amazing. He also knows all about Schubert, Mahler, Wagner, uh, he loves Goethe. And a couple years pass, comes the beautiful summer of love of 1973, which is glorious. 
and we part our ways. I go to Princeton, and he is sent off to Black Hole, Virginia. <laughs> Why is that? Because he hasn't published anything, and Hans Bethe doesn't know what to do, so he calls his friends in Black Hole. And indeed, in Black Hole, they can use a smart guy to compute some radiative processes on a grant that they have from the Department of Energy. So this is the end of a young, promising scientist. Didn't work out, and we could go home. However, Deus es Machina, Peter Carruthers, the professor at Cornell, is appointed a lord of theory division, which doesn't exist outside of the fence at death labs and what's also known as Los Alamos National Laboratories. And he has imperial powers. So he says, I hire Mitchell Feigenbaum. Now, if there was any academic committee of any university in the United States, they wouldn't hire Mitchell Feigenbaum because he didn't have papers. He's done nothing. So why would you hire a guy like this? So Mitchell arrives to Los Alamos, miraculously rescued from the black hole, and he wanders around. He talks to people. He's very smart. He's very impressive. He solves New York Times because even in Los Alamos, they deliver New York Times. And then, bingo, he has a thought about how to think about not turbulence and not order, but the border between the two, which I will explain. And he does something beautiful and amazing. He discovers a thing, you know, which sometimes happens even to the best of physicists. Sometimes they actually do something original. It was so original, it was basically impossible to publish. <laughs> so he did it in 75, but it took three years for the publication to show up. But, you know, he went around, he told everybody, everybody knew that he's, he has done the thing. And that is our second act, which I will now play for you. <laughs> much for inviting me here and uh, it's my pleasure to be here and uh, I'll try to say something uh, I hope interesting. So thinking about fluid turbulence and to see what sort of theory one could produce, in the summer of 1975 I made a, a very curious discovery. I remembered something that happened a few months before and yes, it was a geometric convergence, and the number looked very familiar. So I had a sheet of paper I pulled out of my drawer, and it was the same number. And what do you know, it turned out, these two completely different things ended up having the same properties. I'll be very brief in explaining what Mitchell's work was, because today, any decent college course on nonlinear dynamics should cover it. At the time, it was a discovery. Today, it's a part of the canon of nonlinear dynamics. The problem is that when we think of possible behaviors or motions of systems described by deterministic laws in nature, like Newton's laws or things that describe motion of air and water, we distinguish two kinds of extreme simple motions. Traditionally, we always talk about stable motions. That's the region of order on the right side of this figure. A typical example is an orderly motion of a clock or a slow death of a cup of swirling coffee calming down and getting into its stationary regime. On the other extreme, we have chaos, where any little change in initial conditions very quickly leads to dramatic effects, small adjustments, huge consequences. Between them, there is something I call border of order. I can't call it border of chaos because that's already taken. To distinguish the border of order, that's where you don't have stable or unstable motion. We call that marginal motions. You need a lens. That lens is called renormalization theory. And what the lens does is you 
say, aha, order is here because if I was in this region of dynamics, I would be unstable. In this region, I would be stable. So let me zoom in. What Mitchell discovered that one of the possible transitions to chaos had a self-similar way of renormalizing it. You had to blow up the border by some number of order 2.5. And then you had to wait a longer time to be able to detect it and zoom into it. And that that renormalization, that way of zooming into border of order, was dependent on what kinds of systems you were studying. It is amazing. It was unexpected. It was a discovery. And today, it's a part of the canon. Physicists don't do much research on it, but they have it in textbooks. Mathematicians do amazing amount of research and go way beyond what Mitchell discovered in 1975. The few mathematicians at Los Alamos who knew about this refused to believe that such a thing was possible. By 1976, I had finished all of this, and it made no impact upon the physicists. In 78, there was already interest in Europe. Italian calculations considered Navier-Stokes equations in multimodal truncations, five and then eight. So these are now differential equations, high dimension, that again were showing exactly the same numbers. The fact that the convergence rate proved to be geometric and universal was an accident that dropped into my lap. This took extensive thinking, and uh, I regard this as probably the hardest, best thing that I made. But once you know that scaling, that tells you exactly what's going to happen now. There were all these dissipative things, and one began to understand what was happening in all of them. And all of a sudden, that there was a real experiment and theoretical methods that were written in the style of renormalization group theory, made it amenable to theoretical physics, and the statistical mechanicians who had sort of run out of their renormalization group problems, found that these were another natural thing to work on, and it became a rather serious industry. Well, here's the issue of the foundations of statistical mechanics. And by 1980, what we could talk about was when it reduces to one dimension and when the flow, not the number of degrees of freedom, is two dimensions, is still pretty much what we were able to do. That regrettably continues to be the case. And until someone has some extraordinary new thoughts, it isn't quite obvious where one is supposed to go on this. And so activity in in these renormalization groups is, of course, a lot declined from what it was. New ideas are deeply necessary, so there was the issue of the foundation. Something about symplectic problems begins to work. It was very... And at the end of the second act, Mitchell is a famous person. He should have been on the cover of Sunday, New York Times Magazine, were it not for that schmuck Alfotsin who got elected and got fascists out of power in Argentina. Such things happen. And he's a focus of much wonder, and we are having a great time <laughs> reading all the letters and stuff that we get. But actually, Mitchell is just Mitchell. It just accidentally happened that he did something that resonated with theoretical physicists and mathematical physicists and mathematicians. And then he proceeded on his path in care. He, he looked like a 19th century romantic hero, but he was a 20th century iconoclast. I am eternally grateful to him for liberating me 
I was raised in a cult. I was doing fundamental physics. In other words, I was blind to the world and its beauty. I had been indoctrinated in Newtonian way of thinking. There were equations and you sold them tuka, 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 from initial conditions and on. It never occurred to me to question any of that. But Mitchell, he deprogrammed me with simple questions. The one that had the deepest impact on me was, he looked up, we looked at the sky and he said, do you believe that clouds are supercomputers in the sky? That they solve partial differential equations. Do you think that's how they do it? I suddenly understood it, that it's not at all obvious that the mathematics that we have received describes the world as we see it. Maybe this is not how nature works. Maybe it's not supercomputers in the sky. Maybe it's doing something totally different. It doesn't crunch out any supercomputers. <laughs> and thus the scales fell off my eyes and I was forever changed. And I was deprogrammed thanks to Mitchell. And so comes the act three of our morality play. You have learned what our hero didn't do. You have learned what he did. But now you will learn what he wanted to do. There were two things that we wanted to do. I'll dispose of the first thing immediately because it failed utterly. What we thought was amazing about universal function, as we called it then, was that Mitchell has discovered that no matter what system you're studying, could be chicken hearts, could be boiling mercury, helium heated, helium heated from above, overdriven amplifiers, no matter what it was, you got the same universal behavior, not just qualitatively, but precisely numerically. Now, in the wondrous things around us, which thing consists of many elements, all of them imperfect, all of them shoddily built, and still it works amazingly robustly? Well, it's the brain. So what we found most important about this renormalization theory was not that they described the number of fish in some lake, but that this might be the clue to the how brain works, what makes it robust. Forget it. <laughs> that was crazy and it never panned out. Now, the other thing, number two, that we always thought about was clouds. Now, when I say clouds, there is a disclaimer. Clouds are a very difficult problem, way beyond can of most theoretical physicists. What we really meant by word clouds, we meant turbulence. We didn't believe for a second that there is a supercomputer in the sky. The question was, why would nature use the mathematics that Newton developed for celestial motions to describe turbulence? Could it be that there is a totally different kind of mathematics that we still do not know that describes such amazing phenomena? And there was a very subver and there was a very subversive thought to implant in a young person's mind, and that's what happened to me. Do you think nature uses the mathematics that we use? That was a very subversive thing to implant in an impressionable young mind, and it stayed for me for the rest of my life. Dear friends, so far, many of you that have listened to this presentation 
have known Mitchell personally as exceptional human that he was, but did not really care about the mathematics that he did. If you bail out right now, that might be wise, because for next 20, 30 minutes, things are going down south. This is all going to be math. So back to Mitchell's questions from 1975. Do you believe that up in the sky, clouds are supercomputers that solve partial differential equations? and integrate them forward in time, tuk, 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 tuk. The resounding answer is no. Do they obey Navier-Stokes equation? Yes, but the way they do it is they satisfy them locally, everywhere and for all times. We have to make sure that our description of clouds follows the way that the nature solves the equations of clouds. A few words about turbulence. Our challenge is to use Navier-Stokes equations to describe the turbulence in a way that things that we see in the skies, the shapes, the patterns, we use as a building blocks from which we can describe turbulence. The goal is to start from the equations and make no statistical assumptions. Is it time to do that now? Yes, yeah, because experiments have just become amazing. I have two pictures, one from Mullins' lab and one from Hoff lab. And what we can now see in turbulence, we can see the behavior of the fluid with precision that the naked eye often cannot distinguish from computer simulations. So we have to do three-dimensional turbulence because that's the world in which our plumbers work. But for this talk, it's a little bit too difficult because we lack the power of visualizing a three-dimensional vector field at every point of a three-dimensional volume. Tradition in this field is that one of the starting points is to try to develop intuition, not in three dimensions, but one spatial dimension and one time dimension. So if you have you know, a radial ring with gas coming up, you look at the flame, the flame flutters. And their equation, they describe the velocity of the front of the flame at every point around the Benson. And they're called kuramoto shivashinsky equations. So they look like Navier-Stokes. Velocity is one dimension, just goes up and down. And they're so-called convective fields. You know, if you are moving with the volume, you have to account for that. That's also there. Then there is a dissipative term. kuramoto shivashinsky equations mess this a little bit up. They have lots of chemical, physical applications, but that's not our point at all. It's just to develop intuition about turbulent systems. They're easy to put on computer. The way they work is you record how fast the flame front is going up or down. And the way you do this is at every point you use a color scale. So if it's red, it's going fast toward us. It's blue, it's going fast away from us. And this is space. And tradition in the subject is to be able to put it on computer. We limit the size of the burner. So we don't make it seven kilometers, but we make it a few centimeters in diameter. So this is the perimeter of the Ganson burner spatial coordinate. And now your computer produces the flame front at every later time. So this is time going up. And what you see from simulations is that it flutters and it never settles. And so as far as we can tell, this is what we call turbulent. It's at least chaotic. It's unpredictable. So that's what we will use to develop our intuition. 20 years of work, but we'll do this very fast. When we look at simulation of turbulence in three dimensions, so here is a beautiful simulation by Mark Avila, you can visualize your numerical simulation also in three dimensions. You see various structures. And one of the things that you always see in turbulent systems, and that's what they share with our experience of clouds, is that every so often we seem to see a similar thing. Now, the theory of turbulent flows that a group of people has developed over 20, 30 years 
is very good in exactly describing what happens in a short part of the tube. So one of the questions is this, if you really understand what happens in a small areas, can we put that together as little blocks and from it build turbulence? Can we produce a big system by having little blocks that we stick together and build the turbulent uh, states that we actually see in nature? And you know, what mathematics we need for this? How would they do this? What would the blocks look like? We can do this not rigorously, not very well. Matt Goodorf, the graduate student at Georgia Tech, has done this as his thesis work. And to distill what he did for Kuramoto Shivashinsky is that he found that there are very few small, what we call fundamental tiles, small little blocks, kind of rubbery blocks you allow to stretch them and do things with them. But there are basically three shapes. Not much happens, you know, you wiggle or there is uh, what we call defect. He has shown that you can use this little tiles, here they are. You can stick them next to each other to get an approximate pattern of time evolution of some spatial region of flame front. And then in a way that I'll try to indicate in the talk, you can start with this and you can kind of shake it, stretch it, let your computer glue it together and you get arbitrarily accurate solution of Kuramoto Shivashinsky that has that shape that's given by your little tiles for practical purposes, exact meaning that I can compute it to any number of digits. That says that these patterns, the clouds that we see in the sky, we might be able to glue them together from small videos, that's very important to understand. These are not snapshots of clouds, but these are sequences of how regions of the clouds develop. Because vertical axis here is time. We can give names to these tiles that we have. Matt has shown that in thousands of examples that he has worked out, he can produce solutions of Kuramoto Shivashinsky and the way this is done, and this is the whole idea of what clouds might be doing, it's taking the local things that are consistent with Kuramoto Shivashinsky, that's how we constructed them. And then they have to talk to their neighbors, left and right in this case in one dimension. In three dimension, we're left, right, back, front, up, down. And then they also have to agree with their neighbors that preceded them and that come after them in time. That's the crucial thing. That's you know, one answer. It's not satisfactory in a sense that many years of work will be needed to either kill this approach or to make a workable approach to understand three-dimensional turbulence. The question is, how do you do this? And I'll try to explain that. So that was a little bit about turbulence. And here is a surprising thought that the way to think about it is to make space behave like another version of time. But what we traditionally do, we integrate equations for fluids forward in time. And Kuramoto Shivashinsky is the simplest example. To be able to put on a computer, we make space finite. We cannot make space very large because computers are not big enough, never will be big enough. But it's quite possible to, instead of going forward in time, integrate a partial differential equation that describes turbulence going sideways, meaning in space. Treat the spatial direction like you treat time. So you have a change in time equals some nonlinear function on the right and side. And to make this possible, now you have to make time compact. So what we do is we make we put time on a circle. And you can do it. So here is on the left hand side, Matt takes Kuramoto Shivashinsky on some spatial domain. He integrates it and he finds a solution. Or he takes instant in space 
all values in time and integrates it from the left to right in this picture. And he produces the same solution, either treating time as time or treating space as time. So it's possible to do that, but it's very unstable computation, very difficult, and it's easy to understand why it's so unstable. The same thing happens in three-dimensional fluid turbulence. So while we can do integrations of fluid turbulence, we've hit the wall. We have found that if, as our volumes of fluid get a little bit too big compared to the structure that you see here, our computers just die out. They can't do it because it's all too unstable. So what do we do? The usual way of thinking about Newtonian way, taka taka tak in time, or maybe taka taka tak in space, is not working. Let's rethink this whole thing. The answer, I believe, is forget Newton. Build a theory from the simplest chaotic blocks I've shown you, using the ideas that uh, the laws are the same every place in space and time. You know, these are the typical assumptions we make about laws of nature. We don't want to change them during the week, and we certainly don't want them to be different in Kyoto from Alpha Centauri. When we solve uh, Kuramoto Shivashinsky flame front on Bunsen burner, it put it on a circle. And we say, well, where you're on a circle is not important. So there's translational invariance. Whenever you have translation invariance, it means that you should do a Fourier transform and work in Fourier modes, which are the natural modes for anything that's translation invariant. So this equation becomes equation for Fourier modes, the spatial derivatives become diagonal and there are nonlinear terms. And that's how we, so we actually saw Kuramoto Shivashinsky. If you think in a kind of third millennium way, if you turn this problem on a lot is because we take finite number of points of the circle and then do the best calculation we can do on a computer. What we are really doing is we're taking a little ring with finite number of points and we're going tuck, 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 finite times the space. So we actually live when we solve this problem on a discrete lattice, which is space-time lattice. It's a cylinder because space is compact, but we let time run forever. There is a price because it's very unstable. So after soon of horizon, we have lost all information, but that's what we do. We are used to doing it. I can also compactify time and I can run in space. That's also legal. The thing that we really need to do is we have to produce natural compact solutions, you know, finite solutions that describe the things that we see. And my claim is that what you want to do in this particular case is you want to compactify both space and time and find solution on two tori or d tori in uh, higher dimensions. The way to do it is totally standard. You have points on your fish stocking that's covering your donut because it's translational and in two directions. You do two, take two Fourier transform, one in time, other ones in space. And the moment you do this, time is gone away, space is gone away. We are, you're living on what's called reciprocal lattice on a dual space. The thing that you're solving is actually an algebraic problem and you're trying to find fixed points of this algebraic problem. Every time you find values of these fields on lattice points that satisfy the equation and they have to satisfy it side by side. So this is the local part of this thing. You have found a solution. Now notice there is no integration in time. There's no integration in space and nothing is exploding exponentially when you do this. You're solving a different kind of problem. So every calculation that we actually do is a lattice calculation on a compact lattice. If you're using the laws of nature, it should be translationally invariant because it should be true every place and that's what we do. So there is no time, there's no space. There is a global field, locally it has to satisfy this equation. So there's a high dimensional condition, which is a fixed point condition. And what this local equation says that at every point I have to be nice to my neighbor and I have to follow the rules. I have to mask, I have to you know, not spit on them, whatever the law is. And if we all do this, we will be doing a perfect thing. So that's how Nietzsche does it. The solution of Nevia Stokes or Kuramoto Shivashinsky or general relativity or uh, 
young males or whatever makes you happy, says that on your space or space time, there's some field or set of fields and locally they have to be nice. So locally they follow this differential equation which we inherited from Newton, but globally they have to all live in harmony. So back to Mitchell and his love of Goethe, we used to call him Dr. Faust. Stifelis knocks at Faust's door and he says, you have to say it three times. This is about teaching students. This is a Studiezimmer. Uh, so I'll say this three times and hopefully I'll make some impact on impressionable young minds. What's wrong with what I've told you today? It's a complicated thing. You don't want to run a computer and solve never Stokes. Can I give you a simple pencil and paper example? Yes. That's how we teach chaos also in one dimension. Now we'll teach you chaotic field theory. So we'll do this by looking at something that uh, ergodicists love, people who do chaos. It's called cat map. I'll explain what it is. And I'll show that it immediately generalizes into the field theory. I will want you to think of space-time as lots of neighborhoods, and on each there is a cat. They all want to run away because they're cats but they have to do it in agreement with their neighbors. So that's the field theory they'll, they'll construct now. Now I'll explain why it's called cats. First by doing this cat map. So it's an evolution in time. It has physical origins. You know, you have electrons circling an atom. You can imagine it's a classical electron charged particle and every unit time externally you kick it. So that gives you discrete time and that reduces emotion on a circle to a bunch of successive times integer space. That's called standard map. And it's Hamiltonian formulation. Velocity is momentum and acceleration is the force exerted. And beautiful things come out of this about chaos. But the simplest example of this is if you assume that force follows Hooke's law, it's proportional to how hard I push, you know, the simplest way we teach elasticity. If you do this, then this is a linear system. And whenever you have a linear system that has few variables, you can write it as matrix acting on these variables. And if you make sure that things are continuous, mathematicians call this continuous automorphism, meaning you have a shape and you put it back onto itself. It's an auto change of a shape of the donut, of the torus, or cat. So this is a beautiful thing to teach people chaos when you have mechanics, no dissipation. If this parameter S is larger than two, you push, and instead of behaving like the springs behave, you push and that pushes back. You push and it behaves like a cat, it just runs away. So this is a very clean way to understand chaos and that's how we often teach it. So there are two regimes. If stretching is weak, then hook rules. The thing just oscillates. If stretching is strong, then everybody runs away. And to make sure that, that all the cats don't disappear, so you make sure that they live on a donut. So when they run away, they have to reappear because there is a compact space they can live in. So that's where cat lives. So. If you want to understand chaos, when you're discussing order, harmonic oscillator is what we teach always, you know, how the clocks work, they're very orderly. If you want to teach chaos, you teach them cat. They're wild sisters of each other. They're the most fundamental ways of explaining your theory. Everything I'm telling you now, you can do by hand. That's the traditional cat which we teach in our courses but the modern field theorist cat should be on a lattice. The lattice now is instant in time. So you have to get the idea that space and time are equally good. And modern cat lives on this lattice because we look at it only at integer time. That means I can replace velocity by distance between two fields at two consecutive time instants divided by instance in time. And we can rewrite this equation as a two-step difference equation on a lattice. And it turns out that's much more beautiful than original cat map. This was done by Percival Vivaldi in 
eight to seven, the earliest I've learned it. And what it says is, I am a cat. I sit at instant time T and I have to be mindful of my predecessors and that cat that will follow me. And I want to leave, so I get stretched by this factor S. So that's very simple dynamics. And on the right-hand side is something that uh, physicists like to call sources. That's how CAT works in the modern times. So now temporal CAT says at every neighborhood, I have to follow the law. This is the law. But I have to do it every place. So I construct all the states on the lattice. I make it finite and sites. That's a vector with n components. I get m instructions what I'm supposed to do. This is you know coming from outside and it's forcing me to do stuff. I have a state. I multiply it because it's a linear problem by some matrix, and that has to follow the orders. This matrix is very important. It's called Orbit Jacobian matrix, and I'll explain it in a second. So to find allowed configurations of fields on some compact domain, I have to solve a fixed point condition, meaning uh, I'm on a large dimensional space and I have to make sure that law is followed and that can be written as law equals zero. To do this, I have to evaluate the first derivative of that. That's how we usually solve these problems, uh, so-called Newton method, Newton comes back. And that derivative is now called orbit Jacobian matrix. It's a stability of the whole orbit. If I perturb it at any site, it's described by this matrix. What does it do? It has a very good pedigree uh, from 1886. Its determinant is famous. It's called Hill determinant. And there is some beautiful work by Poincaré to make sense out of this. It says that when I compute these determinants of volumes, uh, Interpretation of this volume is that if I have some solution, I perturb it, its neighborhood in which the solution is recognizable and not perturbed beyond any recognition, its volume, its size is one over determinant. And then there are some beautiful results that if you add up all neighborhoods, you get one. What it means is that all possible states of this system are divided in neighborhoods and each neighborhood certain side and that's done by Hill determinant. So in 20th century it used to teach them chaos forward in time. They would say, well, you know, Lyapunov is how the neighbors on average depart from each other when you have unstable systems. And entropy is this thing with cats. And how many ways can the cat run away and come back? And you count those ways, take a logger and that's called Entropy, and that's meaning of deterministic chaos. Now, this field theory version says, I have to check where Hill determinants are expanding. So these things are growing as I get larger and larger uh, periodic domain, and that will generalize to many dimensions, not just one. And then I have to count how many possible solutions there are to this condition. And these two things, do the same job as positive Lyapunov and entropy, but they don't mention time at all. So they work in space-time. To summarize, you have to think globally, but you have to act locally. You have to, to find what shapes can clouds have. You will have to find fixed point condition and for domains that are finite and compact, you'll enumerate all possible clouds that can sit on that shape. What that means is that instead of looking at something that is moving forward in time, that's very awkward in, when you have many spatial dimensions, you will be looking at something where the fields can exist in a finite volume and every solution will be point in this high dimensional space. It'll be fixed point. There is no Newtonian integration of PDs at all. I mean, this is how you solve it. And often that's what they actually do. So let me say it second time. We can do the same thing in D dimensions. So what happens in D dimensions, a cat sits here, but doesn't only care about what happened before and what happened after, but what are the cats doing next to me on left, right, front, sit? 
So there are lots of cuts and they have to get all together. And you can very easily generalize cat model to a field theory. You just require that cat cares about its nearest neighbors in both directions. You want law of interaction with other cats to be always the same. The rules don't change from day to day. They should be same every place. So these are translation and uh, time invariances. And then we'll say one extra thing that's not necessary, but helps my exposition. Let's say that time is same as space. So I allow to interchange space and time without changing anything. When you do this, Gutkin and Osipov in 216 get a very nice generalization of cat map. I'm at the site N in space and T in time, and I pay attention to guy before me and uh, after me. And I get pay attention to the guy for, to the left of me and to the right of me. And I follow the orders I've been given. And that's what I'm supposed to solve. Once you think about it, you can see there's a beautiful way to do this because there is such a thing, it's called Laplacian, where you compare all your neighbors. It's a very general notion, but basically Laplacian is an object that measures local curvature. So if I have linear relationship with my neighbors, Laplacian is designed that this sum equals zero. But if there are some changes, the Laplacian will get the real value. And you can subtract our cat law and you get an equation, which is familiar to anybody who knows electromagnetism, acoustics, quantum field theory, anything. It's an equation where you have a Laplacian plus mass squared acting on a field being a source. And there is a relation between this mass, which is called Klein-Gordon scalar particle mass and the stretching rate and the dimension. And it's incredibly cool. I never knew that cat map, which for me was some ugly thing that the goddesses, you know, constructed with cats being cut, sliced and wrapped around and stuff like that. It's actually just the Klein-Gordon equation in any dimension. It's beautiful, it's simple. Condensed matter is called tight binding or Helmholtz equation. In field theory, it's called Klein-Gordon applied math. It's called Tampasson. And the main thing is that when stretching S is small, the thing oscillates, so all solutions are sines and cosines. But when stretching is larger than two, everybody is hyperbolic, meaning everybody explodes exponentially. And that's the system we're interested in. So take home. The field theory that should describe chaotic systems will say that if the things are not very reactive, I'll have spring matters. It's called Helmholtz equation. Things will just make nice notes like drums do. But if things are very unstable, I'll have uh, cats running all over the place. And that's called Klein-Gordon. To summarize, what I told you is all uh, the way it should be. We can do any field here in any dimension, including hopefully clouds in this particular way. And the way you can remember what I told you is that we will now enumerate all possible solution for larger and larger domains of space-time. The way we do this is we make sure that tangent space locally is what we are given this differential relationships but globally everybody has to live in har harmony and we can do that. Now this is actually pretty radical because dynamics is dead if that's how we're going to think. I am telling you that I believe that when we look at problems which are unstable in time, in space, you should not evolve them in differential way. You should solve these global compact problems. I'm telling you, that when you want to give a name to a particular kind of cloud, we will not only track how it evolves in time, but we have to look at its neighbors. So if cloud lives in three dimensions, its name will be a three-dimensional block of symbols. I've shown you this for the one plus one dimension, Kuramoto Shivashinsky, where you had an array of symbols, but that's, it should work, it'll be four-dimensional array. I'm telling you that while in one dimension of time, there is something called periodic orbit theory, and this is a way of tiling past and future by repeat of the same solution infinitely many times. 
In higher dimension, we should do this as we do it in condensed matter by finding tiles. To give you an image, in Kuramoto Shivashinsky, when I find spatially temporally periodic solution on one tile, if I repeat it, it'll be a regular tiling or all of the space time. And the way you think about this is that when you have nonlinear problems, it's not Fourier modes that are supposed to be tiling your space time. It's the solution of your equation. So these are non-trivial solutions. And if you want to describe larger and larger regions uh, more and more accurately, you'll we'll need more and more such solutions put together to uh, add them up. So bye-bye dynamics. There is no more time. There is only enumeration of admissible patterns, things that are allowed by the law. It's site is taught. Time is dead. Forget dynamics. This is uh, an old fashioned thing. In future, there will be no future. All these integrators, my friends have developed, they can be junked. I'm sorry, they never worked very well because they only worked at the point of time and they couldn't do large uh, simulations of fluids accurately. They couldn't do it. And the clouds solve the equations as I tried to explain, not by integration, but by obeying them locally and making sure that everybody is well behaved globally. Honestly, absorbing Mitchell's nuggets of wisdom didn't come cheap. It required being frisky at 2 a.m. for people who actually had work like myself. I had a day job as a physicist. Not only that, but for a non smoker, Whenever I had a session with Mitchell, I would come home, I would take all my clothes, put it in the washing machine, take a good shower, because it involved at least one pack of cigarettes, and we didn't like it. Eventually, this would kill him, and it did kill him, which is a pity. His mother lived over a hundred and something. That was the price of being Mitchell's friend.